first and foremost, now that we have some super connectors on, Johnny and I talk a lot about elevator pitch and how important it is to have a compelling elevator pitch. And I'm assuming you guys are the masters. Let's start with your elevator pitch for our audience. Mine's really simple. Three words. I connect people. That's it. It's really simple. Then people get like the whole point of an elevator pitch is to get them to ask a question. Yep. They say, what do you mean? Or what's wrong with you? <laughs> Whatever it is, I don't care. Yeah. I just want them asking some question. You want to make people exactly. lean in. So, you know, a lot of the people get the elevator pitch wrong when they're like, oh, I want to explain everything that I do in one minute. Like I want to get them, they want them to have the exact full picture. But you don't want that. You just want them to lean in and be like, oh, tell me more, right? So yeah. even if it's broader. So if mine's a little longer than Chris's because we can't have the same one. So I go a little bit more in depth and I say, hi, okay. I'm Jen Gottlieb and I help entrepreneurs connect with the media so they can share their message with the world. So beautiful. Then, and what does that mean, right? And I, I don't give all the goods, but a little bit of the goods. And what I noticed is it's very shareable. So if I were to introduce you to someone else, I know exactly how to do it, right? It's not complicated, full of jargon and, and words I don't even understand. Exactly. Keep it at the fourth grade level, right? All the best selling books all time are like that fourth, fourth grade level. What, what about for you guys? Yeah. Let, let's do it real quick. I want to hear yours. We help driven introverts win at work, love and life. That's great. I love, I just got goosebumps actually, for yeah. real. That was really, really, really good. Really good. So many of our audience members are introverts and the idea of being a super connector and putting yourself out there is very intimidating. And Johnny and I always say it starts with one great conversation. And I know you guys have some ground rules as well to help motivate those of us who maybe don't feel as outgoing as the other super connectors we've encountered while networking. What are your tips for those introverts in our audience? Yeah, and, and I love that that's the majority of your audience because for us, it's the exact same. About 80% of the people we work with, even big personal brands, big people, like they would consider themselves introverts. It's really interesting to find that out, especially like some people are really big speakers on these great stages and everything. And then they're like, I'm really scared of being on TV. And, um, you know, I consider myself more of an introvert. So, the first thing to think about the way that we really make networking so easy is you think about what's every single person in the world's favorite subject. What is it? It's themselves. That's right. Exactly. That's so right. if you like networking, the idea of a networking event or whether it's in person or now on Zoom in like a breakout room or whatever it is, it, like it's nauseating for most people, including myself. Like, I, I don't really, yeah, right. Um, so the thing that I always do is to make it really simple is this. First, think about the four letters, H-O-P-E. So help one person every day. So if I go into an event and I'm like, all right, I don't care about trying to meet every single person and do business with every person, date every person, whatever it is, you know, whatever your goal is. But if I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to try to help one person. That's it. And then it removes like all the pressure from me. So then how do I help people I go in, start asking questions. So you get people talking. So I've had conversations with people where I didn't say a word about myself. And they, at the end of the conversation, they say, Chris, this was the best conversation I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I didn't say, they don't know anything about me. That's okay. But because I can then, uh, I, I can follow up with them, do all these other things from there. But really, like, that's the easiest way to make networking really, really simple is think about helping somebody else and not making it about you. Yep. Same thing for every, anytime you're putting yourself out there, just think about that. Help one person every day. Well, by simplifying it, and we see it all the time, it just, it allows everyone to focus on Something that actually matters, something that will actually get conversations going, uh, something to move things forward, but also it takes the, the pressure off of themselves. So now, now that they can relax, where then everything else starts to flow much easier. If you're looking at it as I need to get this card into as many people's hands as possible, well, now you have this gigantic impossible mission that puts you behind the eight ball that has you doing all all this work and and of course once you put yourself in that position you start looking around the room you start looking at all all the people doing what it is that they are doing oh so well and then the only thing you could do after that 
is start beating yourself up and then start drinking, which perpetuates it, moves itself into you hung over the next day. You're not thrilled about your performance, which is only going to lead you for the next few days, beating yourself up even more. Exactly. Yep. yep. So just go in with the goal to help one person or to learn as much as you I can about people. Be interested. And then it's just this mm -hmm. magical thing that happens that after you know you are interested in somebody and you allow them to talk about themselves, they're going to walk away and think you are the greatest human being alive and you didn't even really say anything. And that's just how it works. Yeah. And, and one other thing just to remember. So one of my favorite quotes, and I have so many favorite quotes and if, if it was a drinking game of favorite quotes, every time I said that, everyone would be drunk at the end of anything I do. But one is Maya Angelou, and she said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, people will never forget how you made them feel. So we always think that. With our company, it's the same way. We're like, we're just going to always make every person feel better. Like any interaction they have with us, they have to leave feeling better than they came in whatever it is. And that's how we go into anything. So think about that, making somebody else's day, whether that's like getting, being in the elevator here in like our building and like people, we live in a building where it's all like hedge fund people and stuff and they're all miserable. And we always get in the elevator and we're like, hey, what's up? You doing great? And like, oh my God. We, but we try to like flip people's, flip their energy. And it, it's amazing. It's contagious. It really is. It really, if you come into a situation enthusiastic, especially enthusiastic about somebody else, you know, at the end of the day, we just want to be seen and heard. And, and we, everybody wants that at their core, even if they pretend that they don't. And you go into a conversation truly seeing somebody and being excited about learning about them. It takes all the pressure off of you, takes your ego out of the situation. You don't need anything anymore. All you need is to be excited about what that person's saying. It's so easy. And then that person feels seen, that person feels heard, and then you made that person's day also. And then that's what creates a real true connection. And that's what makes that person want to help you, want to do things for you, want to work with you. Remember you, right? I mean, that's so important. When everyone else is trying to be remembered by what they're talking about and how important they are, and you flip the script and come in and just focus on the other person instead of your pitch and what you have to sell, magic happens. Now, many of us don't have a pitch or a personal brand. In fact, a lot in our audience aren't entrepreneurs per se. So how do we approach it if we don't have our own business and we aren't quite sure what our personal brand is or should be? So I, I think the first thing is thinking about yourself as your own business. So whatever that is, so whether you're, if you're working somewhere, you're a freelancer or whatever, you should think about yourself as a business. Like you're always in the business of marketing yourself, of promoting yourself, whatever that is. And the thing, a lot of times when we talk about promoting, people get really like being a self-promoter, especially the, if you're more introverted or quiet or whatever, like that's a really scary thing. So here's the thing that we say about that, to flip that around for people, is that you have a responsibility to promote yourself. If you're good at what you do, if you like yourself in any way, like you don't have to like yourself 100%. I never like myself 100%. Don't worry. Everything that we do is about 51%. You just have to want it and like yourself. Do these things a little bit more than you don't. But it, it, it's thinking about yourself that way and thinking about what your goal is in anything. So let's say that you work somewhere and maybe you want a better job. All right, so go into things thinking about, all right, visualizing that, right? Thinking about how can I get a better job? What's my dream job look like? And then you're going to put yourself in those circumstances where you're, that's, that's going to come up. Yeah. So when you, we talk about, we, Chris kind of said, it's your responsibility, right, to share. So we're not even just talking about your job and what you do in the world and how you help people or how you make money, but your experiences. So we all have had experiences that make us worthy of sharing a story and sharing about who we are. And those experiences, you never know like who you're helping by sharing the experiences that you've had in your life, right? Our, our uh, experiences can be somebody else's roadmap. So it's our responsibility. If we've had something happen to us, if we've conquered some uh, incredible thing, or, you know, even if we've, we've uh, had something bad happen to us and we came out on the other side, okay, or we did something really cool and really badass, it is our job to tell people about that so that they can learn from it at the same time and that they can experience it. So with entrepreneurs and people with real personal brands, we always say like every day that goes by that you are not making yourself visible to those people that you can help is another day that those people 
that you can help are going to go pay somebody else that's not as good as you and doesn't care as much as you simply because they can't find you and you are not sharing your experiences and what you do with the world. So be proud and remember that it's, it's not about you. It's actually about the other people that you could help with your experiences. Do you have any tips for our young entrepreneurs who are looking to get more solid in who it is that they are and their experiences and sharing them? It's really easy for me to sit here and say like, oh, maybe you have these badass moments in your life where you were incredible. But many people are probably sitting there thinking, uh, no, I don't think I'm that cool and I don't have that many badass moments. And I even think that all, all the time. And it's Same. it's this thing called imposter syndrome, right, AJ? This thing, yeah. it's, it's imposter syndrome and everybody in the world, I used to be on a TV show where I interviewed the biggest rock stars in the entire world, like Slash and Sammy Hagar and uh, all the biggest rock stars and every single one of them had imposter syndrome and did not think they were that cool. Every single one of them. So it's a normal thing that our brain does. It The things that we do don't feel so cool to us because we're too close to them and we're too judgmental about ourselves. But if we were to look at anybody else that did the things that we do and took it and it was them, we'd probably think they're awesome. So the way that I get over imposter syndrome is I have this really amazing tool called the badass list. And I want all of your listeners to do this because it works 100% of the time. When you are feeling like an imposter, you can flip into feeling like a badass in 2.5 seconds. And what it is, is you make a list. So you take out your phone. I do it in my phone. So I always have it with me in my notepad. Make a list of all of the moments in your life, like the first ones that come to mind, when you felt like a badass and they could be big or small, right? They could be the moment your child said, I love you for the first time. They could be when you ran a marathon. They could be when you made your first sale. It could be- Got your first job, moved into your first, first part. Anything, anything where you were like, wow, I'm pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. And like the more that you go and the more that you write, you're gonna think of things where you're like, holy shit, that is really amazing. But here's the key. So you're gonna have this list and you, you still might not even think you're that cool, but this is where it works. Whenever you're feeling like an imposter, you pull out that list and you read it out loud, but you don't read it like you're reading about yourself. You read it as if you are reading about someone else that you are jealous of that on social media. You know, you're scrolling, scrolling. you're comparing yourself to other people <laughs> yeah. and how they're cool, their highlight reels and their lives are. All right, you're reading about somebody else. And I want you to like marvel at that person and get jealous of that person and think, wow, Oh my God, that person is really cool. And then remember, oh wait, that's me. If I could do all those badass things, I am worthy. I'm worthy of putting myself out there, sharing my story, talking about what I do, helping other people because I am a badass. I love that. And many of us, when we're experiencing that badass moment, we don't think about, well, how are we going to remember it later? We just have that amazing experience and then we try to move on and chase the next experience. So having time to reflect on how far you've come is really important when we're going into these high pressure situations, trying to introduce ourselves, trying to connect with other people. Now, Chris, you mentioned the 51% and I, I want to dig in a little deeper on that because I know this is a very important concept that you guys teach and I think it would really benefit our audience who, again, feels like they need to be these massive overachievers to reach success. Yeah, and it's especially prevalent thinking that because you're watch anyone like hustle porn online, you know, in terms of you gotta be a thousand percent blah, blah, blah and all this and that never like, I, I was okay at doing that, but for like a day, like it, it never would last. And, you know, then I would be like, oh my God, forget it. I'm going back to the couch. Um, and the crazy thing is that I'm really thinking about it. I don't know if I ever explained it this way, but where I came up with this idea of 51% was actually in rehab. I got sober almost 10 years ago and I was in a rehab in, um, uh, in Western Pennsylvania in January, uh, uh, freezing cold outside, miserable. And I remember sitting there and, um, they, they would bring in these speakers and talk about staying sober and all this. And my, and reaction was to be like, oh, fuck you. Like, I don't care. Like, I don't want this, whatever. But I stayed and I listened and I did it. And what I realized was it was just, I wanted it just a little tiny bit more than I did. So there was this 49% of me that was like, get up, leave, go home. Like, you don't need this. You don't want this. So then there was that 51% that was like, that kept me there. I stayed, you know, and I listened and I let it soak in, even though I was miserable. And since that time, I've 
apply that to everything, everything in my life. So whether that was with a, just doing something in the morning, like that's good for me. All right, maybe I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it because I want it a little bit more than I don't. And what I've found is that anything, like I've been able to accomplish so much just by relying on 51% of me. Now, the cool thing is that the 51% leads to days where I can be at like 89% or I don't think I'm ever at hundred. <laughs> like, like I'm being honest, but uh, there's days, you know, most of the time I'm, I'm above 80, let's say that, but I know that I can always fall back. I just have to want it a little bit more than I don't. And whenever I do that, everything works. And it, that's how it's always been like since that time. And because before it would be try to go hundred percent, then just be like, I would get, you know, miserable or like I would be at some conference or something and get motivated by somebody. And they would be talking about like running a marathon. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go train. I hadn't done anything in two years. Go out and run eight miles. And, you know, maybe the next day, the same thing. And then, you know, by day three, I'm like, oh, this is taking a lot of time. And, you know, it sucks and blah, blah, blah. And then I'd be back on the couch. And then that's what would always happen. So 51%, like you just have to want it a little bit more than you don't. And when that happens, it's absolute magic. The best part about that, I think we can all relate, whether it's working out or a diet or anything that we want in life, that initial part is always going to be the hardest. But when you're actually exercising, when you're actually at the event talking to people, when you're actually pitching, it feels amazing. It's the lead up to it that we have to push through. We need that extra percent to get us to take action. Yeah. The, the cool thing, too, about confidence and how you become more confident is by doing that little teeny tiny action step, getting the win, right? Realizing, oh, my God, I didn't die. That wasn't that bad. That felt OK. So then every single time you do that, you get a little dopamine hit and you're like, oh, that felt good. So then the next time you go to take that little tiny action step, it's easier than it was the first time. And so every time you get a little bit more confident, I call it like putting coins in the confidence bank. So you take that little uncomfortable action. It freaking sucks. You hate it. It's uncomfortable, but you get to the end and you're like, oh, I didn't die. OK, that kind of felt good. So then subconsciously, we're, we're better for the next time. And then that's how you create momentum. And that's how you get close to your goals. And that's how you become a more confident person over time. And that bank is such a beautiful analogy because it compounds. So you're putting coins in every day, not thinking about the interest rate. And then when you have to get on stage, you have that confidence banked and it's grown over time. And that's such a beautiful thing and a concept for many of us in the audience who want more out of life and look at these people online who appear to be operating at 100%, it's so easy to get intimidated. I'm not Gary V. I'm not Jay Shetty. I'm not so-and-so. I can't do this. They're doing 51% too. And then lights, camera, action, they feel amazing. So getting over that initial hump is so key. Now, you guys obviously do live events like us. And with COVID, a lot has changed in the networking space. And a lot of people in our audience, as we're going to get into the questions here, are now really struggling with the fact that I can't go meet people in person like I used to. My network's not growing. How can we make the most when we are not actually able to go hang out with people, shake hands, hug, do all that fun stuff we were doing pre-COVID? You could also make the argument that a lot of people's roles and jobs and how they promote themselves have changed drastically during COVID. So with this and, and this transition of these events going more online, let's talk to our audience here and help them craft something that's a little bit more suited for them and the times that we're in. Yeah, I mean, well, we're still meeting people. So we're still, and we still have this magical thing called the internet. And I am super grateful for it because if this would have happened 10 years ago, you know, it would have been a much different experience. Oh, yeah. So, we're doing it like we just so this just yesterday and the day before yesterday we went we sponsored an event that we do every we've done every year for four years now called the mindshare summit and it's an event for doctors and health practitioners and um, people that are really healing the world and really leading the way in that in that area and every single year we go to san diego it's this big live event we have an amazing time we sponsor we have a booth we speak on the stage it's like this experience and this time around it had to be virtual and chris and i were like oh, there's no way that this is going to be as good 
there is no way it's going to be as good. It's virtual. It's not the same experience. We're not going to get uh, the same return. You know, all these things that we're thinking about. Exactly. Of course. But we're like, nope, 51%. Let's just dive into this and just- (laughs) We're committed. We're committed. Let's just do it. And you know what? We did have to change up what we usually do from the stage, right? We usually have a whole thing that we do from the stage, but now it's virtual. So we had to make it different, but we went with it and we- We brought the exact same amount of energy that we would have brought to the stage. We brought the exact same amount of energy to the Facebook group that we would have brought to any room that we were in physically. Same thing with what I said with wanting to help people, asking people questions, really leaning into people and using that enthusiasm. And it was different. It wasn't the same. But I would say that we got just as big as a return, if not better. And it was, it was a super cool experience. And then so that they got on a plane. It, yeah. It's about flipping the mindset. But I, I think the important thing to think about, so we had to put in a lot of work yeah. to make that happen. Yeah. So the thing that I think is important and where I see people fail in terms of building relationships or anything is looking for a magic bullet. You know, you're hoping that that person just responds to your comment and says, Hey, come on over. Like, I want to do all this stuff with you. Like, it doesn't really work like that. So the, another thing that we always say and kind of live by is the extra miles never crowded. So the internet, social media has made things so easy for people. So easy. So everyone puts in, not everyone, majority of people put in the bare minimum because it, it makes them feel like they're doing something. And it's also an easy way to then complain and be like, oh, well, I tried. And like, so that trying could just be sending a, um, sending a DM to somebody saying, hey, can I pick your brain? Like, shoot me, you know, the, like the things like that, where instead of like actually being thoughtful about something. So what we recommend, like you want to build a relationship with somebody, like networking opportunities, they're, they're never been better, to be completely honest, because more people are home, more people are like actually have time, like they're not traveling every and single day. And they want to connect even more they because they're connect. missing that connection aspect of their life. So what you have to do is you have to always think about, again, getting back to what we were talking about at the beginning, what could I do to help this person? So, and really think about that because you guys, I'm sure all the time you get people reaching out to you get horrible uh, networking requests or, you know, pitches and all these things where it's about the other person. It's not about you. Like, why do you want to help someone? Because there's something, uh, you know, in it, like there's some in, whether it's uh, the motivation of just helping the person because they had an amazing story or you're like, all right, this person could help me. Like that's just human nature. Believe it or not, I get pitches, which is just. People just send their content with no context of how they want me to view it, what to do with it. I, and it's like, I would love to help you. You went through the effort of sending this to me, and I'm sure you're a bit nervous, but I don't know how to help you here. And now I have to drop what I'm doing to get engage with you about content that you have sent me da- do me the favor of telling me what you would like, how you would like me to watch it, what you'd like me to do with it. How am I supposed to put all of this together? And you would, and you hear this, and you're like, oh, that, that sounds safe. But it's constant. It's all the time. And that person felt like they were doing something. And they, and they were, but they were taking the easy <laughs> route where it would take, if you took an extra five minutes to just Do more research into you. If they're sending it to you, Johnny, they're doing some research into you. Seeing something on social media that you did recently, seeing some core, like a launch you have coming up, thinking about these different things. Just personal, literally five freaking minutes can change the game. Five minutes. But what happens is, that is like people, again, like the extra miles that were crowded. So they're like, all right, I'm doing some. They learn to send a pitch somewhere and they're like, all right, this is all I need to do. I'm just going to follow this thing and send it out and, you know, write your name. And that's the big thing. And sometimes people don't even do that. They leave in the dear first name and uh, you, you want to kill them. So, but it, it's really thinking about all of these different little things that just like, all right, what can I do to help this person? You have to try harder online. That's, that is just what it is. You have to try a little bit harder, but that's how we're like, Johnny, 
funny, if someone were to send you an email and they shared a screenshot of a beautiful review that they wrote for this podcast in detail, like on, right, on podcast reviews and say, like, gave you five-star rating and everything and said, look, I wrote this amazing review for you because I love your show. I'd be honored to be on it. How can I make this super, super easy for you, right? I know that you love this, this, and this, and I would be excited to talk about this. How happy would that make you? And would you open that email? First of all, let's just repeat that because it would make me feel that much better if everyone who sent a pitch sent a review yes. <laughs> screenshot of a review with whatever careful they were what you wish for johnny <laughs> <laughs> they can still pitch to your credit abs 100 not only it puts me in a position to where now i feel guilty because you have given me value what did it take to write that review a minute and a half look what you're also saying you're saying that i value you that much and in, in the work that you do to write a review that i'm thinking about you that i look for a way to add value and without working with you this is the best i could come up with at the moment and i hope that you take notice every one of those points is made and now i'm on the defense of going oh I, thank you very much how can i help you um you know, let's now let's start this. The reciprocity begins. And I mean, this is exactly what Dale Carnegie talks about. And these small favors go so far, which is why help one person out. It really is not saying drop everything you're doing and give them a full eight hours of your day. But everyone could sacrifice five minutes for someone else. We can give five minutes to someone that we'd really love to connect with that we think we could help. Exactly. So I'm going to ask both of you guys, when you help somebody that you care about in some way, how do you feel? Incredible. That's Absolutely. why we do what we do. Yes. Great. So for anyone listening, just remember that. And the, the thing to remember is that when you're not asking somebody for help, you're depriving them of that gift to help you. Now, this is what I'm talking about is like people that know you especially. And so if Jen asked me for help, we're relatively close. Just kidding. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go out of my way to help and I'll feel great about doing that. Yeah. Anyone, but like it, same thing with like people, even like people who work for me or whatever it is, like I want to help people, but I got to have, you got to make the ask, right? You got to make the ask. And so many people don't do, don't make the ask because they're just scared of what the other person will think of them. But this the amazing thing happened to us where I flipped my mindset about that and now we'll never have a problem oh, asking yeah. for help. So we were at Santa Monica Pier one time. We were there for a conference yeah. or something and we're walking in, you know, the Ferris wheel was up there. And I was like, I really want a picture in front of the Ferris wheel. Like, you know, like every girl wants. And, uh, and I didn't, I hate asking people to take a picture of me. I hate it. I like, that is my worst, biggest pet peeve. And I think it's like a New Yorker. I don't, like thing. Yeah. I don't want to put anybody out. Okay. So Chris is like, there's a woman right there. She's by herself. Just go ask her. I'm like, Oh my God, it was torture. I was like, okay, fine. I'll just ask her. I'm, would you please take a photo of me and my boyfriend in front of the Ferris wheel? And she takes my phone and this woman starts doing a full photo shoot of us in front of the Ferris wheel, like work, loving every second of that photo shoot, like every angle. She gives me back my phone and she was like, thank you so much for asking me to take a photo of you. I used to work at Disney World as a photographer and it is my one joy in life to photograph people and nobody asks me to do it anymore. And you just gave me such a beautiful gift. So thank you. And I was like, oh my God, if I didn't ask that woman for help, I would have not been able to give her that moment. So now every time I have a weird thing about asking someone, I think about, well, it's, they're going to feel so great if they get to help me. It's a beautiful example of, again, just going that little extra step that most people are afraid of. And there is so much to unpack here. I want to talk first that I think with everything moving virtual, introverts finally have an advantage. Hell yeah. Think about it. All of the pressure we would put on ourselves to get in the car, to park. I don't know anyone who's going to be there. I, all of that's gone. We just have to show up and turn on the camera. And you could do it with your PJ bottom still on. So as introverts listening to the show, now is the time to take even more action. And the second thing that I want to talk about is the asynchronicity of communication online. Many people will send the one pitch and not hear anything and immediately go, that person doesn't want to help. That person's not interested. Not realizing that right now, you know, if Johnny were to open his inbox, I were to open my inbox, 
it is slammed with people pitching. And it's not to say that I don't like their pitch or that it's a solid no. It's just there's too many for me to even acknowledge and get a hold of. So what are the strategies that you guys have when you have a really great pitch and you want to make sure that you at least get a response? What's the follow-up strategy? Do you use boomerang? How do you get it in front of the people and stay persistent enough in today's virtual asynchronous environment? I love this. And I'm so glad you brought this up because the fortune is in the follow-up. It's so, and more so now than ever because people are so busy. I know from, I use myself as an example all the time that there will be people that will hire or whether as employees or as like contractors or whatever. And the only ones I really wind up ever hiring are the ones who are so good at follow-up that like where it's almost like, I know that they're feeling like, oh my God, I don't want to send this. Like, I think he hates me, but I'm like, oh my God, I want to work with them. I just don't have the time. Like, and then I'll just start in the inbox and all this. And they keep following up and keep following up six months later, boom, hire them. Uh, but, it, and it's just because at right time and it's not, it, it's not because I don't want to do anything with them. And I think it's so important for people to remember. So we do, we have a PR agency and we also have these programs where we bring in so many people from the media and we ask them about like, do you want people to follow up? They're like, please, the only way that we are going to feature them is if they follow up. So I, I think that it's such an important thing. And I, the thing that we like to um, encourage is so uh, you, you have the initial follow-up and then let's say nobody gets back to you like a week later, just, hey, just bump it up. That's fine. After that, it's gotta be you're bringing them value in some way. You're sharing something of value with them because it can't just constantly be like, hey, still there, still there, bumping this, bumping this, you know, any, like the worst thing to do is like get annoyed with somebody and write and be like, I saw that you opened, like you have like some email tracker, saw that you opened my email and you're, I can't believe you're not responding. Like that's like report spam, goodbye. Um, you'll never work with them, that type of thing. But with if you're providing some type of value and just understanding and remembering that there's a person on the other side that's opening that it's you're not just a machine and it, it's so important like to understand that i think the biggest mistake people make is they forget that it's a human on the other end like they people forget that it's a person because it's really easy in, in technology to think that it's not there's not someone with with a heart and a soul and a mind that's reading your email that's actually taking it in it, and so we always say, be pleasantly persistent. So remember that it's a human being and, you know, and say, hey, I understand that you're super busy. If you didn't get back to, if you don't, like, if you didn't see it, that's totally okay. I get that you have a lot going on, but I really wanted to, sh I saw your post yesterday about this, this, and this, and um, I absolutely loved it. And I thought that you would really enjoy this article, or I thought that you would really enjoy this pitch idea. I thought of it because I was inspired by the article that came out yesterday that you wrote, you know, just really being thoughtful. Like we said, the extra mile is never crowded being pleasant with your follow-up pleasantly persistent and remembering that it's a human and how can you add value to that human every time you send them an email and i always respond if someone is offering me value when they're following up i'm like that is awesome thank you i'm going to respond right now now we've been telling all of our x factor accelerator membership participants how important linkedin is right now there is more traffic going to linkedin than I would say ever before with all of us now stuck without these in-person networking opportunities. And many of our guys have never touched their LinkedIn. They created it, they have a job, they're happy, they don't even think about it. And we were pushing one of our members to just get some references about what your skill sets are. Not whole hog, but just go out and put a few things out on your LinkedIn that would improve it. And it actually opened the door to a new job, career change, that he never anticipated because someone in his network saw that update on LinkedIn and said, oh, actually have this opening you'd be great for. And many people are missing out on these opportunities because they haven't viewed LinkedIn accordingly. And I know you guys are big on LinkedIn and obviously your elevator pitch should be on your LinkedIn. It's the billboard for who you are. What are your strategies or mistakes you're seeing people make on LinkedIn that need to be improved to put themselves out there? So the dumbest thing that I still see are this, this line. So people who write this to me, like, I don't want to have anything to do with them. They say, I get this all the time. And it's just a variation. I want to connect during these troubled times. It's even more important. And like, for some reason, guys, I don't know why, but some 
dark times, like whatever, like there's somebody who wrote some script that says, start with this. And to me, it's like an automatic no. Like, I just don't want to have anything to do with the actual person. I mean, I, I think like the, the simplest thing, again, like taking like an extra minute to just see what, what about this person? Who do we have in common? Like make it actually real. Like that, that's the, dip, like, that's the key. Like, that's it. Like yeah. the, the, the generic, I want to connect to, I see we have some people in common, but then they don't say any of those people. And then they don't realize that any of those people, I don't even know. Um, and that I'd love to connect more. Like, What's in it for me? What does that mean? <laughs> exactly. Like yeah. that's, again, like you never want to give like somebody a homework assignment. So that's giving me a homework, trying to figure out, all right, well, great. Like, why are we going to connect or what's in it for me? Like that, that's like making me think. And like, I don't want to think, like, I just want to delete you um, and report you to LinkedIn as I don't know you. No, just kidding. Um, but uh, <laughs> there's something about that one that is like anything around that, like where it's like, we're here, we're six months into it. Like you're still looking at this as troubled times and, you know, dark time, like the, this uncertainty and like all this, like, all right, then you're not like, you're not my type of thinker. So my biggest pet peeve, it goes along with this, but, and this is also, this goes for when you're pitching the media too, you know, because we talk about how, how to pitch the media, if you yeah. like you're in the media anything copy pasted. If I know that you copy pasted something and you're sending it to a million other people, and I can tell, you can tell when something is to a million other people. If, if it is that, then I am deleting you and never talking to you ever. But if you take time to say something, and we've been talking about this, this whole conversation, something specific about me or, you know, about what you would like to talk to me about, or what you'd like to learn from me or the person that we have in common. And it's not a copy pasted thing. I'm going to respond to you because you went out of the way to like write a few things and to do your homework. That was like 2.5 seconds. It's so easy. It's so easy. And then with the media as well, pitching the media, people make this mistake of writing, you know, writing one pitch and copy pasting it and sending it to a whole bunch of people, right? Like the exact same one. We talk to producers every single day and they're like, I know when somebody copy pastes a pitch and it's going out to everybody, I don't even open it. I delete it immediately. But people that say my first name in the subject line and say that they know me from somewhere and say that they read a previous article of mine and it's not copy pasted, I actually respond. So everybody that's listening, if you ever have the urge to send out a million LinkedIn messages to all of your contacts and just to be easy and time efficient, you're going to copy paste the same thing. I'd love to pick your brain or I'd love to connect. That's an automatic delete for everything. But the better thing you can do to be more efficient, send three messages, but make them super thought out. Do your research, look into what that person enjoys, right? Like what, where do they like go look at their Instagram? You can see everything online now and make those three messages really well thought out. And you'll probably get three out of three responses. Whereas if you send a hundred copy pastes, maybe you'll get one or two. And that's so key because what people are posting on their own, they care about. They're already giving you the little breadcrumbs to get in their inbox. If they're posting about it, they care about it. So it's very easy, again, going that little extra mile to find the relevant information of that person. And if you think about it from the media's perspective, what does the media want? They want a scoop. They want to be the first one to the story. They don't want to know that you've pitched it to a thousand people and they're the fifth puff piece about this. They want to be the first one to declare that you are amazing, that you're uh, something that people need to pay attention to. But many of us aren't thinking about the person on the other end of this. And of course, then we get frustrated and we beat ourselves up when our pitch goes straight into the trash bin. Exactly. Now, we have some questions here from our audience. Hey, AJ and Johnny, longtime listener here. Love the show. I just received my master's degree. And now that the celebrations are coming to an end, it's time to move forward and look for a new job. I've cleaned up my social media to make sure it's appropriate for the nosy future employers. My question is about LinkedIn, though. It's kind of up to date and all, but it just doesn't really stand out. It reads like the minutes of a very boring meeting, which sums up my past few years in any case. I could really use some tips to make it shine. Any advice? Thanks for everything you guys do, Maria. We've heard this a lot, too, that many people have just used their LinkedIn like a resume and don't really think about what someone who's encountering their profile for the first time thinks. What do you guys say? 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing, uh, whether it's your LinkedIn, uh, people's like about page on their website, whatever it is, there there's like this idea that it has to be a certain way. So I think a lot of people for LinkedIn have that idea. It's got to be a resume or it's got to be written in like like how a resume is written in some weird way. I don't know, I haven't had a resume in a long time, but in some weird language and all this. And they don't talk how they would actually talk if they were de describing themselves to a friend. Um, so what I would suggest is doing exactly that. So just having a conversation with a friend and record it and actually talking about like have the friend who like have, hopefully knows a little bit about you but just like to ask you questions and you talk and you answer and you forget that anything about LinkedIn but you're recording it then you just go and you get that transcribed and go, go to rev.com you know it's a 10 minute conversation it'll cost you 15 bucks uh, to have it transcribed perfectly then you go and you pull the, all the best stuff out of there and then you write it that way like Nobody wants to read. Like, I, I see this even funny. Like, a lot of people in the media we deal with, and like, I'll read their bios, and then we'll be bringing them in as guests, and they'll have like the resume things. I'm like, I gotta make this good. Like, I gotta make them sound interesting. Like, they're so much cooler than they wrote here. Like, I know that about them. So, thinking about different things to, that you wanna pull out. So, we were talking earlier about the lean in moment. So, uh, one of the big things around that is like credibility markers. So what's something interesting that you've done? So go back to that badass list. So what are some of the interesting things? Like what's something that's going to get somebody's attention and be like, oh, wow, because that's how our, like whether that's a person that you know or a skill or a place that you worked. Yeah, I, so sometimes it is not the most professional thing. Remember, they're people that are humans. They're humans, they're real people, just like us that like to laugh, that you know, have kids, have family, like to go to movies, you know, like all the same things that we like to do are reading your resume. It's not necessarily just like professional people. I mean, it is, but they're humans. So put some fun stuff on there. And I have, I mean, it, it could be out there and it's just gonna make someone lean in and be a little bit more interested. Like, oh, that person's got a lot to their personality. I wanna know that person. For me, when I was an actress, I had a resume and I would go into auditions with my resume. It's a different type of resume than a LinkedIn resume, obviously, but I would say the exact same type of thing goes for someone's resume on LinkedIn. The, I was on a heavy metal rock and roll show on VH1 for 14 seasons. It was a really incredible piece of my career, really lucrative, really amazing. And for that audition, it was a hard rock and heavy metal show. So you would think that I should go in there knowing everything there is to know about hard rock and heavy metal and have my resume to prove it, right? That's what you would think. And that's what Maria would probably think about her resume. It should be completely professional geared towards everybody that she wants to talk to. Um, but I walked in there and yeah, I did some research on heavy metal music. I didn't know much about it, but I like Googled and I went in and at the bottom of my resume, <laughs> it says this still, it says, does an awesome Britney Spears impersonation. Now you would think that I should not write that on a heavy metal audition, Britney Spears. That's a big no, no. Right. But that's a lean in moment for me, for everybody. They all like my Britney Spears impersonation. So I kept it on there. You know, it makes me different. It's, it's interesting. Um, and so I go into this audition and one of the fifth things they ask me is like, Oh, you know, cause they're humans. Yes. They like heavy metal music, but they're also humans. They're like, that's cool. You do a Britney Spears impersonation. Can I hear it? And I did my Britney. And when they called me and said, I booked the job, which was probably one of the biggest jobs of my life. They said it was your Britney Spears that got you the job. So you never know, be you, be you and share what makes you different and what makes you special. That's what's going to make your LinkedIn profile or resume or whatever it is stand out. Of course, in listening to that, I, I couldn't stop but giggle because if you're Googling uh, metal before this interview, you better find something else that's going to win you the job. <laughs> and that Britney Spears impersonation certainly <laughs> would do the trick. That would take uh, that would take attention away from the fact that you're regurgitating Google facts on heavy metal that you found, which would be very apparent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, actually, in, in my, that audition tape is on YouTube somewhere. I was like, you know, I listened to everything from Beyonce to Black Sabbath. That's what I said. Like, I didn't know what that was, but I was me. I was being me. And ironically, that's what they liked. And that's what everybody likes. Be yourself. 100%. And that's what... So important. Yeah. And, and that you ha had the wherewithal to, to showcase yourself rather than trying to play this, this character. 
And of course, I, I would imagine that is exactly why you got the job, right? You were not afraid to be who you were going into that interview. And that's a, that was a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing it. That LinkedIn profile, many have this view that it's only going to be read by people in my industry or people who know my job really well. So I have to use all this technical jargon and overcomplicate it. And they don't think about the thousands of other people who are going to encounter their profile who might have opportunities for them, but they can't decipher anything they've put on that profile. So yes, talking to a friend and sharing with a friend what you do is going to break it down for anyone to understand what it is that you do. And if you're not quite doing the job that you want to do yet, paint the picture of what that future journey looks like for you with expressive emotion on your profile. So even if you're not in the role you want today, someone seeing that can see your potential. And just like Luis in our X Factor Accelerator, he didn't even think, he's just like, oh, why do I need to do this? And all of a sudden someone in his network didn't even know he was looking for a job, didn't even know he had this skill, and he never would have thought to do it because, oh, he knows he has the skill anyway. Why share that? And that's why it's so important to paint that full picture of who you are everywhere online because that is your billboard and that's how you open these opportunities. Now, our last question here is about dreaded Zoom meetings. And many in our audience, like Johnny and I, are now fully on Zoom, eight, nine hours a day, it feels like, and it can get really boring. So do you have any tips on rocking Zoom meetings? I'm spending a lot of time in them over the past few months. Yesterday, I had a six month review with my supervisor and it didn't go too well. I'm definitely an introvert, and was kind of doing okay in the office environment, but in this review, the main points were that I seemed disengaged in meetings. And I get it. It's tough enough for me to sit through a one-hour meeting in the office, but sitting at my kitchen table staring at the screen makes it so much harder to engage and concentrate. Any tips would really help me, Justin. All right. So the simplest thing, Justin, it, it might be hard. Like again, extra miles never crowded. If you act, do you honestly want to fix it, or are you looking for some magic bullet? So if you honestly want to fix it, like you're gonna have to act at least act like you're into it. So I'll give you. You guys are great examples. Like you're nodding the entire time, smiling. You know, doing these little things like. It makes such a difference. So I guarantee you, Justin, if you even just watch this interview and see like how when we're talking there, you guys are engaged, you're, you're doing these little things. You want to, you, you want your supervisor, like will be, it'll be a hundred, like 180 degree difference if you are just being like, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, like just little tiny things like that. It's so simple. And yes, do it for, even if you're not like that into it, it's okay. You guys might not be into what I'm saying right now, but they're faking it make me feel good. So I'm like, wow, they love it. Yeah. So don't forget the most interesting, like people care about themselves. They're interested in themselves. They want to feel good. I, I had somebody in an audience once, she was such an unbelievable audience member. She was so engaged the entire time, all this, like I looked for her after and wound up like getting her to come to our event. Like she's like her entire life changed because she was such an unbelievable audience member and so engaged. So just show some enthusiasm. Like again, 51% Justin, like that's it. I guarantee, I guarantee if you do that, even if you feels weird or whatever, it, your supervisor, because I know like when people on our team, like aren't engaged, I'm like, all right, I don't care how good they're doing. Like they're not into the zoom meeting. I, it drives me crazy. So I, I really think it's that simple. Like just be engaged. And the more that you do it, the easier that it gets, but I get it. Like zoom fatigue is a thing. It's, it's a, thing. a real thing. Like you get tired yeah. from being on zoom. And then before you know it, you know, you're leaning back, your eyes are glazing over like what I'm doing right now. So what you can do and what I'll do is I'm just trying to be, you know, like with your workouts. Okay. So I don't know if people here work out or go to the gym, like you recover to get stronger. So, you know, you go to the gym, you make it an efficient workout and then, or, or you try to, and then you rest so that the next time you can be really efficient. So I do the same thing with zoom fatigue. I make sure that no matter what I carve out at least 30 minutes to go outside, go for a walk and not look at any screens that refreshes me so that when I go on to my next meeting, I know that I can be efficient so I can be leaning in and nodding and, you know, making the other 
other person on the other side of the screen feel really seen because you do have to try harder on a screen than you do in real life. You just do because you, you can't feel the person. So you have to give a little bit more. So in order to give a little bit more, you got to rest a little bit more. So take a little bit more time off the screen so that you can give a little bit more time when you're on the screen. I compare it to theater and television. So if you're on the if you're on the big screen, your your movements, your facial features, they're going to be exaggerated. But if you're on a theater stage, you need the person in the back to to be able to feel your energy. And so you're going to have to over exaggerate a lot of those actions. And I see Zoom in the same manner. The other thing that I wanted to bring up is if you do have a lot of Zoom meetings and you want people to understand that you're serious and that you're engaged will show that through your setup, through your zoom setup. I mean, even my little thing here shows that I want people to, that I'm caring about these to go through, to make a scene that I'm well lit, that you can see my face. Um, I've been in so many group meetings where people's faces are dark. Um, they're not well lit. If you are showing your engagement, then all your efforts are lost because you're not well lit. I mean, it's just, it's such a, a simple thing. Lighting is everything. A few things jump out at me. The key being in the kitchen, right? Sitting at the kitchen table. And it sounds like if, if you're sitting at the kitchen table, you're probably eating at the kitchen table. You may even be cooking at the kitchen table. And I have a dedicated space in my house for Zoom. Amy, work from home, my fiance as well, has a dedicated space. And you go in there and you turn it on. Like that's my zoom space. And then I have my reading space. I have my space on the couch and no matter how small your space is, you can create that zoom corner that, you know, when you're there, you turn it on. And I will tell you the biggest change for me in all of this was getting a stand up desk because getting out of sitting and getting out of slouching, it allows me to show you that I'm enthusiastically engaged. It's just like when I'm in front of the room teaching, I don't sit on a stool and teach to show my enthusiasm. I have to stand up and I have to use my hands to show that enthusiasm. That is just as key. And the last piece, I did it right before we jumped on here. I went to do not disturb on my computer and turned off everything else. You want to make impactful Zoom meetings. Everything else in the world has to be turned off. You can't be checking your Apple Watch. You can't be surfing your Twitter. You can't be checking the time. People see that. When your eyes go to the other parts of the screen, when you're reading all of a sudden, people pick up on those signals. And you would never do that in person. But right now, since we're staring at screens, it's so easy to be sucked in. Oh, this notification. And oh, maybe that's a Slack message from so-and-so. And oh, is that a new lead that I get to talk to? And all of a sudden, your boss is on the other end saying, AJ doesn't want to be here. AJ's disinterested. This is coming up on AJ's performance review. So Zoom presence, just like owning the room, you got to fully commit to it. You can't be distracted if you want to nail those performance reviews. Now, we love asking our guests for a challenge for the audience. What should they do in the next week that's going to make them stand out or maybe open up that super connector mindset for them? Mm. Go ahead. You go ahead. I forgot right. about it. So the next week, what I'd like you to do, and we'll keep this simple, is reach out to five people. But so what I want you to also do though is just be intentional about who those people are. And ideally, ideally, it's somebody that you have in common, a connection in common with to make it even easier. So think about all the stuff we just said. So seven days, I'm only asking you to reach out to five. You can do them all in one day. You can do one Monday through whatever it is, but just reach out to five people in the next week and think about before, like, what, what am I looking to get from this and how can I help? How them? can I help them though? Do not say to those people, no, you're I'd not, like, I'm I'd saying like in to your pick mind. your brain. No, yeah, yeah. Don't say, I'd like to pick your brain. I'd like you to take, to take you to coffee, Zoom, so I can learn about whatever. No, reach out to those people and figure out how you can help those people and offer them some sort of value. And yep. I can promise if you do that with five people, if you reach out to five people and offer them some sort of value, something, an amazing opportunity will come out of that. And remember it's the relationships are the shortcut, but relationships take a while to build. So, but once they happen, they're the shortcut. Everyone has a unique X factor and your X factor is when a mindset unlocks a skill set in you that makes you special. We would love to hear from both of you what you think your X factor is. 
Mine's enthusiasm. Oh, you stole mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have to think of a different one. <laughs> that, it really is. Like I show up and anything that I do, I do it. It's going to sound weird because I just said about 51%, but I put everything into anything that I'm doing where I need to show up. And I'll show up enthusiastic. And as a result, I think that I'm really, really good at helping people to accomplish things that they never thought possible because I believe in them and show them that enthusiasm. Mm. Okay. The X factor for me is every single time I have a conversation with someone, I make them feel seen. Yeah. And I I always, always, no matter what, it is about the person that I'm talking to. I want to make sure when I leave that conversation, they feel seen, special, and heard in every single way. And I think that if you can master that, making every single person you come in contact with feel so seen you can, you will get every opportunity that you want because they're immediately, like we talked about earlier, the law of reciprocity is going to kick in. They're going to be like, wow, that person made me feel so good. How can I make them feel good? So, and it just feels great to make someone feel good. So make I, I love that. And that's what a lot of wallflowers introverts need to remember. Um, If you're, you're not out and you're not introducing yourself People are going to read into that and they're through their own fears. They're not going to think, oh, that person's shy or that person is a wallflower. They're going to tend to think that person's aloof, that person's stuck up. So when you can allow others to be seen, you're opening so many doors. So I, absolutely. I can't second it more. Now, for those in our audience that would love to learn more about your Be On TV boot camp that starts tomorrow. Tell us what it is. How do we get access to the media? I know you guys are superstars. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes. So be on TV bootcamp.com. And what, so basically what we did was we, we have a system of, we talked about a little about a bit of this stuff here, but in terms of helping people to get on TV, to build their careers, build their lives, build their businesses, um, it, 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 so many people think that it's like a black box. How do I do that? I have to be somebody that I'm not. And we say the opposite. We encourage people to be more of themselves. So, and to determine and see exactly from that, what are, just like Jen talked about, what are your badass moments? How do you take your knowledge? How do you take what your expertise is? How do you pitch that in the right way so that people actually open the pitches, want to read it, want to book you, and how to do all of that in, with people that you already know? So we know, and we've proven it over and over and over and over, that it's not about having to hire a PR agency like us, which we have an amazing PR agency. And but we're very expensive. So for a lot of people that can't afford that or um, that are maybe starting out or in, you know early in business, how to take their relationships that they already have and leverage that to get onto TV. We show people exactly how to do it in five days. Five days. And here's the thing. So there might be people watching or listening to this and thinking, oh my God, but I've never even done a Facebook live before. I've never been on camera before. Like I can't even imagine being on TV, let alone pressing go live on the social media. So many, many, many of the people that have gone through our boot camp are people that have never ever been on camera before in their lives. And what this Be On TV boot camp does is not only does it teach you how to pitch mainstream media and get on TV, but it also teaches you how to be on camera in general and in life and and in a safe space. So we provide a really, really, really safe environment for people to be messy, to be imperfect, to press the record button and just be exactly who they are, to have their Britney Spears moment and just be them. Because at the end of the day, right, your mess is your message. Like the, the messy parts of you is what makes you special. And actually the mainstream media, that's what they lean into as well. So we just get, you know, put more coins in the confidence bank each and every single day of our Beyond TV bootcamp. Camp. And by the end, people have have huge transformational experiences that have nothing to do with being on TV a lot of the time. And uh, and secretly, you guys, you know, we are a media company, but we're really a personal development company that uses media as the gateway. Because when you can start to put yourself out there in that way and step into your greatness as an expert or as someone that has experience in something that could help other people, you really step into that badassery and remember that you are not an imposter, that you are enough, and it helps you in all areas of your life. So that is our Be On TV bootcamp. And everyone that is listening, regardless if you've ever had any image of yourself being on TV or not, you should join. 
I love that. Thank you both so much for joining us. Such great tips to get out there, both online and in person. And I'm excited for the boot camp. This was so fun, you guys. Thank yes, you so amazing. Much. I love talking to you guys. Great conversation. Yes. Loved it.